Has a big tech company ever made a decision that you strongly disagreed with? If you can relate to this feeling, then you can tap into how users, some users at least, felt when Apple made a decision that would change the history of video editing forevermore. The app we're talking about is Final Cut Pro, and it's still going strong, although some would say it's a shadow of its former self. So uh, before we get into it, let me just explain what the app is by itself. It's a Mac-only, non-linear video editor, which basically means that when you're editing video footage, you can access any frame at any time. And so we're going to look at two versions of it, basically the legacy version and the modern version. It was very fun to go back in time and look at it and compare it to today. And to say the least, the results were surprising. Let's start our story out in the early 1990s. This is a time when Ninja Turtles was huge, and a guy named Randy Ubillos was working on the first major digital video editor that was called Premiere. It was made by Macromedia, which was later acquired by Adobe, so that's why it eventually became Adobe Premiere. But he was working on it, and the company came up with an idea in 1995 to make a new, faster video editor, separate from Premiere, that was based on Apple's QuickTime. So they codenamed the project KeyGrip, worked on it for a few years, and by 1998, it was ready for a demo. So what was now called Final Cut was demonstrated at the National Association of Broadcasters. And it's interesting because there was both a Windows version and a Mac version shown. So the original Final Cut was actually cross-platform. A little fun fact there. All right, so this is a crucial moment in the history of Final Cut because a man named Steve Jobs got wind of the show, and he was Apple's interim CEO at the time. He looked at it and was like, I got to have this for the upcoming iMac. So he got Apple to acquire Final Cut and its development team. Macromedia was not thrilled about the idea of, of Apple having a video editor, but Jobs made the case that both Final Cut and Premiere could coexist in harmony and he was persuasive enough to satisfy Macromedia. And so Apple was off and running with Final Cut, and a year later at the next NAB show, they showed off the new, now-titled Final Cut Pro. This software was designed around traditional editing styles, so it was a natural fit for the film industry. And thus it grew in popularity and got a bunch of awards and was really on the rise. But it wasn't until a movie in 2002 that was edited with the Final Cut that the app proved itself. And this, this movie was The Rules of Attraction. So the software kept upgrading and there was more versions. And it was th these were really the glory days of the program. There was a bunch of major movies that were edited with it. You got 300, X-Men Wolverine, even No Country for Old Men, which got nominated for Best Editing used Final Cut Pro version 6. So everything was fine and dandy. Everything was going great. Until in the late 2000s, the last version of 32-bit legacy Final Cut Pro was released. It was version 7.0.3. In 2011, a completely redesigned 64-bit version called Final Cut Pro X was announced and released. And, oh, oh, that's great. Oh, it looks awesome. Well, there was problems because it was, in a way, a different program. They dropped several features, and when you get right down to it, it was iMovie on steroids. Uh, a lot of people were, were not happy. There was a lot of criticism. Uh, even a petition was started. Uh, but Apple largely ignored this, and uh, they basically responded to the community by making a manual to help users transition from the two. So um, what I want to do in this video is look at why was this such a controversy? What is all the fuss? One of the first things that people figured out is that you can't open up a 7 project in X. But some of the changes are just in naming, really. Uh, for example, with organizing your, let's just say, stuff in, in the legacy version, you have bins and sequences, which in the newer version, 
is essentially events and projects. So some of the same functionality, but just different terminology. There's other differences. For example, in 7, the panels are free-flowing and you can drag them around, but in X, they're all attached in one window. Some of the functions are essentially the same. For example, setting in and out points in your footage is basically the same with the I and O key. If we go down to the timeline, this is where some of the divisive changes were made. You have in the newer X version a magnetic timeline where clips kind of snap to each other and it, they don't land where you drop them. They land in front of or behind whatever clip is on the timeline. Whereas in 7, the clips will go wherever you, you put them. And also in 7, you can mute tracks. Even the idea of tracks is a thing that is not in X, where you have different video tracks and audio tracks, whereas in the newer X, it's basically just one track with layers above or below it that are free-flowing. So I actually, I, I think the tracks were, were a lot cooler. That's one of the things that I wish they kept, but alas... They didn't, <laughs> so I can feel a little bit of the pain. But on the flip side, you have the effects, which I think are done much better in X than 7, because in 7, you have to manually render the effect before you can even look at it, whereas in X, you can preview the effect. And that's the thing. X, I find, is is quicker to, to whip things up, whereas 7 is is slower but has a more professional feel. It was a lot quicker for me to add a title in X than it was in 7, but essentially it was the same organization. So all in all, I was very surprised to find that it really isn't that much different. And I know that's blasphemy for some of you, but uh, I could see myself being able to transition back to 7 pretty easily. In some ways, it's unfair for me to say that because I'm working with a version of X that was made 10 years after the one that was originally put out there. So maybe it was a lot different back then, but I didn't find it as jarring as I thought I would uh, going back to 7. What I wish that they did is just upgrade iMovie and maybe call it iMovie X or something and continue the old legacy version um, so we could have seen Final Cut 8, Final Cut 9. Um, uh, because the idea of a professional video editor is intriguing, and now Final Cut is more of a YouTuber thing to use. And yeah, you can get it for 300 bucks. Uh, there's a trial version that you can use for 90 days. And it's actually, it's not even called Final Cut Pro X anymore. A couple years back, they dropped the X from the name. So now it's just Final Cut Pro. But the legacy version is out there as well. You can get that for $60 on eBay, but you're going to have to dust off an old copy of Mac OS X because uh, High Sierra was the last version to be able to run it. I mean, no one's really using the legacy version anymore because uh, a lot of those professional video editors moved on to Adobe Premiere. And so actually, as it turns out, Steve Jobs was right that there is a place for both Final Cut Pro and Premiere, and I think that's a good note to end on. Thanks for watching this video today. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, you might like some of the other videos on this channel. Either way, I hope that you are doing well today and tomorrow, so take care.